Hi. Put a waiting room just in case we were Zoom bombed or something. Okay. Hi, Peggy. Hi, Laura. Can you hear me? I can. Excellent. I don't always get the audio right. <laughs> me too. <laughs> well, look at all the people already. Holy look cow. Look at that. Hi. Oh, jeez. Always a mystery when that little that little timer thing keeps going around and going around whether it's ever going to finish up. Mm -hmm. So how are you all? One Good. Time. Where are everybody's at home. Yep. Okay. Well, here we all are. All right. Good. I built in a waiting room uh, mainly because if for some reason we had an uninvited guest that was inappropriate, I could remove them and not disrupt the meeting. Okay. Uh, likely, but it's a safeguard, so I'm just keeping an eye on letting everybody in. Okay. Who would be an uninvited guest since it's a public meeting? Well, someone who from the public who came in and then was inappropriate, like we've had happen in the legislature with... Uh, Okay, I'm just you know, asking. I don't racial know. slurs, things like that, that I wouldn't want us to spend too much time um, trying to manage. Lisa's coming. Okay. Mark's coming. So how's the last half year been for you all? Hi, Lisa. Lisa. Is new to Zoom, I think. I got it. You got it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Well, look at that character. Yeah. That looks like Mark Hage. If I didn't it know it, I got a haircut. I'm fine. How you doing? <laughs> I got one. <laughs> <laughs> the economy's going to recover quickly. Yeah, I, that's really for America. no other reason. It's a little shaggy up until last year. <laughs> And John, who used to have hair longer than anybody else on this kind of on this call, gave that up years ago. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're eight, waiting for seven, Zach. Seven, Tracy's seven. on her way in. And Jeff Fannin is joining us at some point. Right. Okay. So that'll be uh, board members, we're waiting for Zach, and staff is here. Can you hear my air conditioner in the background? No, but I've got farmers hitting the field, so I'll go on mute. I, I see the clock behind you. So the two retired people here are Lisa and me, and we probably therefore have the least experience with Zoom. My experience with Zoom is game night <laughs> for the extended family. And uh, that's pretty much it. And, and teaching grandkids every day for about half an hour. That, since that's a, a fellow I don't recognize, I'm assuming, sir, you are Zach. That's right. Good, yeah, and you okay. have your audio on too, good. Well, we'll have introductions as soon as John Pendolfo joins us and that's it. Yeah. Well, we're all here and it's three o'clock. And so therefore, let us begin. We were expecting uh, one, one other person, but he's not on the board. So and, and I'm, I'm glad we're able to do this. Let me start first by saying my voice is affected by allergies at this time of year. So if I, if I get too raspy or too soft, let me know and I'll, I'll yell. Uh, but aside from that, uh, let us start by welcoming our two new members, Lisa Grout and Zach McLaughlin. And uh, 
you probably don't know all of us. So why don't we introduce ourselves and then I'm going to yield for just a minute or two for each of you if you want to take the opportunity to just say a word or two about yourself and maybe why you decided this was a good idea, this appointment was a good idea. I'll start since I'm, I'm talking. I'm Joel Cook. I'm the current chair of this board in a rotating sort of fashion. And uh, I've, been, uh, I've been associated with Beehive for upwards of two decades. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for, for now so we can move on. Uh, anybody else just pick up? board members and then staff, I guess. I'm John Pandolfo. I'm currently the superintendent of the Barry Unified Union School District. And um, I am unfortunately uh, resigning from this board because I'm moving out of state in about 12 days. Okay. How about you, Peg? Apologies, my phone comes through my iPad. So That's what it was, okay. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I'm Peggy Maxfield. I teach middle school math in Brattleboro, and I used to have the room right next door to Lizzie, Zach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tracy? I'm Tracy Wren, superintendent of Lamoille South. Two, three, four. Okay, so uh, uh, Laura? What about Zach? Well, I thought I'd go through you guys first and then, then let the new people oh, introduce okay. themselves. Um, so I'm Laura Soares. I uh, work with the Vermont School Board Insurance Trust and one of my uh, job duties is to support VHI and I do that. So um, I'll also say, Tracy, I do think it sounded like we could hear your air conditioner when you spoke. So just be aware of that. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Chris? Sure. I'm Chris Roberts. Uh, nice to meet you and welcome. I am the manager of finance for Visbit and therefore the manager of finance for VHI as well um, as part of your service agreement. I have been with Visbit for um, about 19 and a half years now. So I've been involved with uh, doing VHI's financials ever since day one. Thank you. Uh, Bobby Joe. Hi, I'm Bobby Joe Sauls, and I work at Vermont School Board Insurance Trust. I'm the VHI Program Manager. Mark? Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Hage. I'm the Director of Benefit Programs at Vermont NEA. I think I'm in my 19th year as a trust administrator for VHI, and for many of those years, actually, I was also on the board. True it is. True it is. Okay. Uh, which of you uh, new kids on the block would like to begin? Lisa, your appointment, I think, predated Zach's by, I don't know, a nanosecond or two. So why don't you start? Sure. Um, I, first of all, wanted to say I'm really, I'm, I'm humbled to be on the board because uh, probably more than ever, uh, access to health care is an expression of our fundamental values as a, as a people. So for me, it's, I, I can't think of a more important job than I I hope I can do something positive. Um, I, I taught 30 years plus as a social studies teacher at North Country Union High School. Um, I live in Newark. I'm on the planning commission and I'm a justice of the peace. Um, I, a little bit about me, I was raised in Italy and in Switzerland. I'm an American. My parents live in Spain and this pandemic has been very difficult. Um, I met my husband at UVM, he's a Vermonter, and uh, all three of our daughters uh, did their undergraduate work at UVM. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Zach? Yeah, so uh, Zach McLaughlin. Uh, I'm currently superintendent of schools in uh, Springfield, uh, but I am a Brattleboro resident. Uh, and my, my, my wife uh, is a, uh, has been, up until just a few days ago, a teacher in uh, Wyndham uh, Southeast Supervisory Union, but has just taken um, another uh, position that moves her uh, closer to the dark side as she moves into some quasi-administrative uh, work. Um, and uh, so, um, uh, but really looking forward to, uh, to working with you guys. I know this is, this is hard work trying to figure this out. Uh, and uh, I'm with... Lisa, it's, it's, it's really super important work. If kids are gonna get what they need, we need a workforce that gets what they need. 
and, um, and, uh, and a system that's able to support it. So I'm looking forward to doing my part to help, help make that happen. Great. Thank you, Zach. Thank you, Lisa. Welcome on behalf of all of the rest of us who have been around. Welcome to this. Uh, I couldn't agree more with both of your assessments of the importance of this work. And so now let's get down to it. As I, I made clear in any number of ways, I really, really, really have to leave at five o'clock. And that comes as no great tragedy for anybody else on this on the call. So let's get going. <clears throat> Uh, item three on the agenda is a review and adoption of the agenda itself. Uh, I assume everybody's more or less reviewed the agenda. Are there any concerns, any additions, uh, any comments? If not, can I assume that we've adopted the, uh, why don't I call for a vote on adopting the agenda? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Somebody opposed? So I've muted some people, and in order to take minutes, I'm going to need you to determine a system where either people actually speak or you say their name and they put their hand up or something so that I have okay. a quick record. All right, well, let's do it that way. I'll, I'll you know, signal that you want to speak, and I'll, I'll be the gatekeeper, and Laura will be, actually, Laura will be the volume keeper. Okay? All right. Thank you. Good. Um, item four is public comment. Uh, Seeing no member of the public, there won't be any right now, but assuming as I've been informed, Jeff Fannin from Vermont and EA uh, does join this meeting, uh, I'll recognize him if he's interested at the portion of the agenda that deals with, uh, I presume the, uh, well, it'll be uh, item 11 on this, on this agenda. So sometime down, down the list. All right. Uh, the next item is approval of the board minutes for January 15th, uh, 2020. Uh, as I, I will have a, a comment, but I'll first recognize anyone else. I see John would like to speak. John. John. You're Sorry, right. I, thought, I thought Laura was going to do it for me, and then I realized I had to do it myself. But oh, I was okay. going to make a motion to approve just so that we can then enter into discussion phase. Okay. Second. Tracy seconds. Uh, any discussion? Uh, I have uh, three items, uh, two very short ones. The first is when you look at paragraph, uh, page three, the last paragraph, uh, in the uh, discussion of our One Care Vermont uh, item, uh, the word access in the motion should be assess. So instead of A-C-C-E-S-S, -S, it should be A-S-S-E-S-S. -S -S. Understood? Okay. The second item is, I think just beyond that, the commission, I forget how it's worded in the minutes, but the, the reference to the commission, I think, to the commission in its proper name, which is the Commission on Public School Employee Health Benefits. As worded in the, in the minutes, um, there's an implication or an inference that could be drawn that this commission somehow is engaged in all bargaining on a statewide level, and it's only health benefits that are the subject of bargaining. Those are the two substantive changes. Uh, so let's deal with them first. Are there any, any objections to those? Seeing on, we can put them aside as adopted. The third one is, is as uh, you've read in the last day or so, if not the last few months or so, uh, John submitted a, a memo on January 15th uh, relating to me and my testimony before the Senate Ed Committee. Uh, it was considered and decided not to be attached to the minutes of that meeting. Uh, I draft, I wrote a response because there were more people uh, on his than are on our board in March, I think it was March 13th, and it was going to be uh, considered in some fashion at our next live meeting in March, which never took place. And I don't, I don't think we even touched on it on March 23rd. So here we are at the next more or less opportunity. All I want is for my response to John's memo to be treated in the same fashion as John's memo. In the minutes, there's a reference to uh, 
um, his request that it be attached to the minutes of the meeting was uh, rejected. And then there's a parenthesis which says um, appended to, which says that his memo is appended to the minutes for the record. And that's okay as uh, unless, and uh, until and unless uh, the minutes as we adopt them uh, include that memo. So all I want to say is this, if, if we retain the attachment of John's memo uh, to the minutes of the January 15th meeting, then I would like my, my responsive memo to appear either in the same place at the same time or attached for the record to, uh, to, the, meet, to the minutes of this meeting. Uh, John, you were nodding. I don't know that you want to say something, John. I guess what I would say is I, I agree with you 100% about consistency of, your, consistency of our approach in that they should be either both go in or they should neither go in. For the sake of efficiency and not getting bogged down in this right now, I would just suggest they both go in and we move on. That would be my suggestion and I'm amenable. Okay. All right. Uh, any other comments? Tracy? I would ask that that uh, strategy be applied to previous communications as well, or previous minutes that have not been approved as well. Well, that will, that will call for an extended discussion. Can I suggest, Tracy, that we hold off on your suggestion until such time as we have a uh, more relaxed time? Uh, because it's a separate issue from uh, what, how we deal with John's memo. It's up to you. Uh, I don't need extended discussion right now. I need consistent strategies for dealing with supplemental information provided at meetings. And if we're going to do that at a future meeting, that's fine with me. Where does that leave us? There will be a there will be a discussion about that. So um, the motion had to do with just the limited memorandum uh, memos that we're talking about here. How do you want to proceed, folks? And I said I concur with the motion with the limited um, scope right now, provided there's a discussion in the future and a consistent plan for dealing with this. That's fine. Okay. All right. So uh, with the understanding that there will be an agenda item somewhere in the, down the, lo the, the line about how to deal with matters that written matters that go above and beyond what's in the agenda. Uh, we're left with the motion to adopt, uh, to attach, I guess, my, let me do it this way. I, I wanna be uh, precisely equivalent, John, that rather than, it, my motion, I guess, will be to append my response to John for the record uh, to, to the minutes of this meeting. There's work? a motion on the table. So could I just offer that um, I would amend my motion to state that we approve the minutes with the two corrections that Joel provided plus the appending of Joel's um, memo in addition to my, you know, to, in addition to my memo to the minutes. Thank you. That, would, that makes a lot more sense than the way I said it. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye, or thumbs up or some. Laura, would you prefer hands up for votes? Uh, that's fine, as long as you hold them for a minute so I can see, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Okay, uh, we now get into really the, the meat of what this group really talks about and uh, the business of providing health benefits and how they get paid for and all the rest as we move into items uh, at least six through 10. So I will yield the floor immediately to, uh, I guess, the staff and Laura, I'll leave it to you to figure out who goes and, and what. And what yeah, so I'll, I wrote the memo, so I'll do the update and then Bobby, Joe and Mark can, or Chris can add to it. Okay, so we should be following along one of the, atta the attachments. So the, right after the minutes, there's a memo with the VHI logo, VHI's FY22 proposed health rate increase. 
Thank you. I have it. Uh, everybody else? We shared this with you or those of you who were on the board in February and it went to the Department of Financial Regulation. Just a, a brief catch up. When we filed our FY21 rates, we did so, um, and those are the rates that will go into effect this July 1st and be in effect for another 12 months. We did so with a lot of uncertainty around how the statewide Commission on Public Employee Health Benefits would resolve their negotiations. And also at a time where our net position was below our target. Uh, net position is another word for our reserves or our money that we hold in case we need to pay more in claims than we're anticipating. So um, we put a 2% load on. So our rates had an additional 2% in FY21 to account for those two conditions. And when we, uh, the commission reached its decision through an arbitrated process, the Department of Financial Regulation asked us to relook at our rates from an actuarial perspective on whether our FY21 rates would be sufficient given the arbitrator's decision. And this summarizes the report that we gave to the department. We basically concluded, and the department concurred because they approved our rates, that given that we had built in this 2% load, we could absorb for six months in FY21 the additional cost that the decision would bring to us um, without having to reopen our rates and that we could adjust in FY22. And the actuarial analysis uh, estimated 1.3 million of our reserves will be used in that six months of FY21 because the health benefits are more generous overall than they currently are from an out-of-pocket cost coverage. And they estimated that we could have um, a drop in our target net position further if we have more people join the program because of the lower eligibility standards. And it's not necessarily that more people bring more risk. There was no reason to think more people would be any different from the, you know, 36,000 active employees and family members that we already have. But because our target net position is a ratio of expenses to money on hand, and our expenses would go up when you have more people, even though it's offset by revenue, it's still a um, ratio could put us even further below our net position target. But as of February, we felt that our 2% addition had positioned us reasonably and that we would sort of bear the brunt of that um, change in the FY22 rates, which we'll be setting in the fall. Because we won't have any more information setting the FY22 rates than we have right now. So we'll be um, using the same actuarial analysis in that process. So I just wanted to bring you up to speed on that. And unless there are questions, and I think that we can talk about FY22, and then when Chris talks about the financials, I think she'll be able to sort of put this in a bigger perspective about our financial situation heading into the FY22 rates. But that was the update on FY21 that we never had a chance to talk about in March. Thank you. What's your pleasure, everybody? Any, any, any questions? Any discussion? Thank you, Laura. Good. All right. <clears throat> Go ahead. Tracy. Right. Managing my mute is tricky. So uh, would you like questions about um, FY21 rates and better understanding of the, the underpriced? My concerns are that the FY 20 rates are underpriced, so the FY21 rates, which are based on the most recent unchanged actuarial analysis, might also be underpriced. Would you like discussion and questions about that to wait until Chris talks, or should we discuss, can I get more information now? Well, what are the risks of being redundant later, Chris? Should we go into that now? I'm totally fine with waiting. I just want to know when the right time is. Well, there's not a lot of enthusiasm being shown. Why, why don't we hold off? Okay. Uh, any other questions about this particular item? Laura, it looks like you've said what you want to say. Is that right? 
Yep. So in FY22 rates, it's mainly a timeline change. Um, we have set the rates in August, you as a board member. And actually, as you know, the actuaries determine the appropriate rates, but we've decided whether or not those rates can go higher or lower by using our reserves and trying to add to our reserves. Oh, yeah. And we've made a decision with Blue Cross and with Vistas to change our process a little bit and not file rates until the very last day of October. We'll actually need you to have that rate setting meeting the week of October 19th in order to keep to that schedule. It still allows school districts to have that information to build into their budgets. Um, but what it does is it allows two things. It allows the Green Mountain Care Board to have finished their hospital budget process so that we have actual hospital budgets um, to build into the rates instead of trying to estimate those. And it also allows Blue Cross to pull a couple more months of claims data to use for the filing. And so it really tightens up the process. We've been hesitant to move out because school districts start asking us, frankly, in August for what our rate um, will be. But given that that bargaining doesn't happen around health benefits anymore and people aren't starting bargaining discussions and business managers have learned that the rate that we give them in the end of September is their best, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. Um, we've, mm -hmm. we've talked to business officials in making this decision and didn't get any big pushback. So we've agreed at least for one year and we imagine that it will be ongoing. Um, we've seen in the last few years quite a bit of volatility in our IBNR. So IBNR is when we end a year. So for example, we're gonna end on June 30th our FY20 year here at VI, and we'll have an audit and we'll close the books. We still have a lot of claims that have to get paid, health claims, that won't get paid until July, August, September, October for things that happen before June 30th. And so we capture that estimate in something called IBNR, incurred but not reported. And then eventually we have those claims and we know the real number and any adjustments gets carried to the next year and, and put on the books. And we've had quite a bit of swing in the IBNR up and down in the last few years. And we think that by moving the rates out and having better claims data, we can reduce some of that volatility. So this is really an FYI. Um, and unless Mark or Bobby Joe want to add something to that, I think I've said what I've wanted to accomplish on this item. Good, thank you. Anything, Bobby Joe, Mark? Nothing for me. Okay. Uh, so the message, aside from the substance, is that we need to meet sometime in October. <laughs> right. October, the week of October 19th, and that's critical in order to get all the pieces lined up with Vistas and Blue Cross and DFR. Okay. All right. Okay. Is that is a, so that's it for item six. Is that right? Thank yeah. you very much. Item seven. Uh, is uh, should be more interesting than anything else that so I'm going to take to it show the relevancy of, of what we're going through to uh, th the world at large go ahead Laura I'm sorry so I'll do a and B and then Mark and Bobby Joe you two can decide who wants to do C um, so we went through a period in early March and into April where we made some adjustments to our health plans to respond to the pandemic and some of them were um, required by DFR or were really clear, but there was one change that we asked the board to weigh in on. So some of the things that we've done um, through Blue Cross and we basically mirrored Blue Cross is to, there's no cost for, to the um, subscriber or their family for COVID-19 testing. And telemedicine was more available um, primary care doctors could be seen via telemedicine and get paid appropriately. And we have a campaign monitor with a whole list of all of the various things that we did to try to make sure that people didn't have cost as a barrier to care, got care quickly, um, helped to reduce the severity of claims for people who had COVID-19 and helped reduce the spread by the fact that it was caught and cared for early. Um, as a side note, before I forget, we are not aware of any serious COVID-19 uh, case in our entire membership. Good, that's an obvious question, good. Doesn't mean that we don't have people who have COVID-19 and test positive 
we had some treatment, but we've had no significant um, case. Of course, when we were doing these actions, we had no idea what the outcome would be. But one of the things we asked you to do over email, and you did, was to waive out of cost, um, out of pocket cost share for inpatient COVID-19 treatment. Um, that was something that, again, we felt needed board action. And you took it over email, which our bylaws allow us to do. But now those of you who were part of that email chain, and that is five of you, Lisa had joined the board, um, to actually ratify it by resolution, by adopting the resolution that is in your packet to waive the out-of-pocket costs for individuals who receive inpatient treatment with COVID-19 went into effect um, in April, retroactive back to March 13th. And then if the resolution is adopted, um, each of you will need to sign your own copy of this and get it to me so that I have a complete record. So you're affirming what you did by email. All right. I would make a motion that we adopt that resolution. Is there a second? I second. Discussion? Uh, Tracy, Tracy beat you to it, Peg. <laughs> uh, discussion? Uh, all those in favor, say aye. I'm signed. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Good, because it has to be unanimous. <laughs> And uh, if I understood you right, uh, Tracy, each of us had, in his or her own way, will get a signed version of this to you. So there will be six individual pieces, right? There'll be five because Zach was not. Five, excuse me. You can I, I really, snail mail is fine at the Visbit address or um, scan it however you need to. If you could do it this week, that would be helpful so I could close that record. Good, thank you, great, okay. So another COVID exercise that we did, and this was primarily Chris um, and I, and with some input from Bobby Joe, was we looked at the risk that we have, not in claims, because we, we don't, at this point, we still don't have a good prediction of COVID-19 claims themselves, whether we'll have a second wave pandemic. Um, we also don't know, given the suppression of treatment, that people have gotten the normal treatment that didn't go on in these last six, eight, 10 weeks, I've lost track. How many of those people will have more severe outcomes because they delayed treatment? You know, we don't have any in information about that. But the, the exercise that um, Chris and I started was a cash flow worry. Um, we, believe it or not, have about $22 million uh, that we collect in premium every month from school districts and visitors, and we pretty much put it right out the door because our average claims in a month are 20 to $25 million. So money in, money out, um, it works. Our reserves are there um, if needed to, you know, keep that going. But we are worried about the ability of the state, um, visitors and school districts to pay us in a timely manner in the fall depending on what happens with school budgets and state payments to schools and so forth. And um, one month delay in premium could put us in financial jeopardy, to tell you the truth. We've had visitors um, delay payments to us uh, without notice and with notice, and it's a scramble from a cash flow point of view, you know, to just come up with another $4 million one month that you weren't uh, waiting for. We've had school districts not pay us on time in the past. Um, People see us as a friendly vendor, so that if they're having a little bit of a cash flow issue, oh, we can hold off on our health bill for a few weeks. If more than a few districts did that, we were worried about being in a tight spot. So Chris and I um, looked at what our options are, and frankly, um, we have no good option. So we looked at um, a line of credit at the bank. You know, they wouldn't even give us probably $2 million, uh, two weeks worth of claim money, you know, up to $12 million at a pretty high price. Um, no guarantee they'd even open the line of credit, but we had initial conversations. They charge you if you use it, they charge you if you don't use it because they're holding up, you know, they're tying up their money. They need our um, reserves held as collateral. So that was really not a feasible option. Um, Using our reserves is not really a feasible option 
because those reserves are not intended to pay normal claims and we would quickly drop below our um, threshold that our net position policy says we'd have to take formal action with DFR. And we even looked at could we borrow money from the dental program that has a fair amount of money, but that might give us one week of claims. So um, I guess the, the information to you is that it's really critical for us, and we've communicated this to business offices, that they continue to pay us on time. And I think it's critical for us to let the state know as they think of how to help manage cash flow of the state while they've delayed property tax payments and have a delay in all sorts of payments, that we need to make sure that in order to pay claims in a timely manner, um, we're gonna need school districts to pay us. So we've done the exercise, that's our conclusion. And um, hopefully the fact that we've done the research will keep school districts paying us in a timely way. Uh, Tracy. Um, this could be a long shot and you may have already researched it, but as we are an intermunicipal insurance organization, might we be eligible for the um, arbitrage arrangements that school districts get? where we can actually borrow based on cash flow shortfalls and invest and make a little money on our cash flow loans? Um, that's something we could not look at, and we certainly could. So we can look at that. Of course, if school districts can do that, then they should have the money to be able to pay us, which is a simpler approach. Um, but thank you for that idea. I may have missed the uh, uh, sort of intro the introduction of this. <clears throat> is this a root? Is this an annual event? What What's the cause here? Is it just the the fact that life stopped? The pandemic is the cause. That's the the, the that's deficit okay. in the education fund that's supposed to be worse in FY twenty one. Right, I got it. Schools may not have the cash if they even had one month. If we had a third of our members or twenty five percent of our members try to delay us. For yeah. three weeks, we could run out of money. I understand. Thank you. Okay. Well, if I understand it, uh, that's for our information. And I guess we're not the ones communicating. The board isn't the ones communicating directly to school districts to pony up or the retirement office. But, uh, but there's no action for us to, to take. Correct. This. Okay. That's uh, item 7B then. Uh, is that right? Yes, so now we're at the dental program, which either Mark or Bobby Joe can relieve me of having to talk. <laughs> Bobby Joe, I'll, I'll defer to you. <laughs> sure. Uh, apologize, my compressor going in the background, it's worse than air conditioner. Um, so right. we found out from Northeast Delta Dental um, a few weeks ago that they were going to do a premium holiday for all of their self-insured, not all their self-insured, sorry, all their fully insured business for the month of July. Mm -hmm. um, they offered it to us as something that we could do as well if we wanted to, but it's not something that we could do, that they could do for us. Um, so just as an example, uh, the average, you know, as you know, as we all know, all of our dental services have been put off um, for the past almost three months and services are just starting to pick up now, um, but it was quite a drastic drop. So um, in a month, we would normally have about uh, $600,000 in claims, um, and we dropped down to about $46,000 in claims. So about, um, at, Chris had it figured at 7.5% of normal expenditures. And this is on um, page 13 of your, of your document. Um, so what we're suggesting to do is to have a premium holiday um, for all of our business for the month of July. Um, basically, and I can have Chris jump in and, and help with this if you'd like, but uh, basically we would ask them to not pay their July bill as opposed to trying to refund money to them or um, we looked at it a few different ways, but basically they would receive a bill and we would ask them not to pay it for the month of July only. Anything to add on that, Chris? And just the only other thing is that um, Delta Dental um, is uh, providing administrative relief for us for the month of July. So our admin, our admin is about 44,000 a month. So we will not be incurring an admin charge from Delta Dental. 
Um, so our premium relief to our members, uh, our normal build amount is around 635,000 a month. And um, we wouldn't have the admin, there's about 45 of that. So mm -hmm. we'd be subsidizing about 590,000. But like Bobby Joe said, our claims have dropped off so significantly um, that it just feels like the right thing to do. And for the newer board members, um, our reserve position, our net position with the dental pro program is uh, significantly in good shape um, compared to the health program. The health pro program is in good shape. The dental program is in really, really good shape. Really good um, shape. So. Well, this looks like a, a no-brainer, except for the, the wording of the motion. I'll, I'll recognize uh, Tracy and John, uh, but I suggest one of you guys come up with some basic wording for a motion, and then we can put it on the floor. Tracy? Uh, I had a question. Do you want me to make a motion first? Question later? Uh, it doesn't matter. Just my, my question is, what's your ETA for communicating the, the decision? I'm just thinking about payroll impacts and the amount of time it takes to actualize um, the non-collection of premium when there's an employer or an employee contribution. Tracy, we have this um, drafted to go tomorrow if it's something that the board wants to do. Okay, so I move then that we uh, accept the trust administrator's recommendations to have a premium holiday for dental premiums for the month of July. Thank you. Is there a second? Can, can we call it premium relief, please? We can call it whatever you want. Um, for yeah. some reason, Delta Dental's legal department did not use the term premium holiday. I didn't feel that VHI wanted to vet that all out. Let's, it's their language. I, I think we should need to go with that. Okay, so the word is relief, R-E-L-I-E-F? Yes, right? please. Okay. I think that we can Thanks, just Chris. Sorry about that. that without any formal action. Uh, is there a second? Uh, I see John's hand as a second. Okay. And John, you also wanted to see. Just clarification, uh, Joe, use the they. We, we will invoice, um, I think you, I don't remember now the words you use, them or they. Are you saying we, they, they don't pay us the districts or Northeast Delta Dental? Sorry about I just that. Got confused yes, in no, my that's head. okay. Um, the, so we bill the districts directly, and we will ask them not to pay us for the month of July. They being the districts. Thank you. Yep. Rare moment of good news for people, <laughs> however small it might be. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. Uh, thumbs up, hands up. Uh, any opposition? We have adopted the motion. Thank you. Uh, okay. And we are moving on to the financial. This is where you come. This is your big moment once again, Chris. All right. <laughs> so um, I, I may spend just a couple more minutes for the benefit of the new board members. Um, Good. That's fine. Please, please feel free to, to you know, ask any questions at all, um, either in the meeting or later if something comes up. You know, I'm always here for you and um, feel free to uh, throw anything out of something and you digest it and say, wait a second, I, I got a question on that after all. Um, so you have a couple of different versions in your packet um, from the different months. So originally um, the first memo that went out was on April 16th and that was the financials as of March 31st. At that point, we were showing an overall loss um, of 10.5 million. And um, this was compared to $1.1 million gain when we compare that to uh, 331 of last year. So this, is a, this was a significant change. And when we looked at um, December 1st, you know, we were at about Chris, the same. You're kind of breaking up, Chris. I don't okay, know if that, you want to call in. Yep. Let me do that. So Chris lives in a rural area where often she can't have video and audio. Because I muted everybody, including you, Joel, just to see if that helped, but it didn't. So give, and Jeff Fannin's here with his mic off, so maybe he's monitoring and uh, getting something done while he's waiting for that item. And I think I have to let Chris back in, so I'll watch that. 
sometimes shutting off video also helps for someone in her situation. Well, that's good to know without actually logging out and calling back in. So you do see that um, Chris is going to talk about March and April financials. May financials won't be available for about another two weeks. Um, she'll get you May financials as soon as uh, we have them. She's waiting. Let me see if I can get her in. Here she comes. Okay. So sorry about that, everyone. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, sorry, we're all shaking okay. our heads, but you can't see. I can't see anymore because um, you can only do this one way. You've either got to be on the phone or on the computer. Um, okay, so, yeah. so, so um, let me start over quickly here. Um, I was just, just saying how when you compared our uh, loss of 10.5 million as of March 31st, uh, compared to a $1.1 .1 million gain as of last year, uh, obviously, that's a huge swing and something to uh, start paying uh, significant attention to. We were, um, you know, down as of um, the end of December also. And at that point, that was a little more normal for that, the cycle of that time of year because the new um, deductibles and everything resets on January 1st. So we traditionally expect the first quarter to be a more positive quarter. And then it really didn't play out that way. So I spent some time um, delving into that with the actuaries. And some of that is addressed in your April 29th memo. Um, basically, they had uh, several things that came into play. The UVM Health Network had a claim submission delay, which uh, so there were a lot of claims coming in from UVM in the first quarter that normally we would have seen prior to the end of the year. Uh, we also had uh, Caremark um, invoices were delayed. Um, they had a big catch up uh, at, the, at the federal level. And then Blue Cross had tended some claims that they were implementing because of their new operating platform. But those claims they actually had captured in IBNR at year end. So what's really driving the difference of what we didn't expect was the UVM and was a portion of the UVM claims and the Caremark claims. So um, going forward to April 30th, we actually did start to see some improvement. Um, so by April 30th, uh, with the pandemic, which there's some irony here that it's actually taking a health pandemic to help out our health program. Um, by that point, we were showing a only a $4.9 million loss in the health program, and that was as a, as a result of um, claims starting to taper off. All those claims had been paid through that had been append, amended, and then, um, you know, we didn't have a lot of claims activity of people going to the doctors in, in March and April. So we started to see some of that coming through. Even though we're showing a 4.9 million loss on the health program of the, as of the end of April, I still expect we're going to end around nine or $9.5 million loss for this year. Going to IBNR, what Laura was alluding to earlier, 5 million of that loss is because of FY19. So um, basically under reserving in FY19. And then we're looking at a $4.1 million loss for FY20. Uh, which is still what the actuaries estimated when they did our last round of rate filing. So to address Tracy's question, um, I've, I've pressed the actuaries on this. I've become more and more involved with our actuaries over at Blue Cross. And they feel confident that when the FY21 rates were set, they had taken into consideration these factors. And we don't feel like we're going to end up with that. Um, you know, they feel like they've taken into consideration the drivers 
that we're feeding that $4.1 million loss for FY20. And we don't expect a repeat of that. Um, having said that, what I will always remind everyone about the claims and IBNR is that, you know, two, $3 million sounds like a huge amount of money, except when you're dealing with a pool of this size and claims of over $200 million a year, it is very, very easy to be off a couple of million dollars when you're trying to project what claims expense is going to be for a given year. Um, so, so that's, that's the kind of the financial picture. I don't know if people wanted me to go through the specific, you know, the financials themselves or just more where we are. Chris, this is Laura. Can I see if this is a correct summary statement? So FY19 is going to show a loss of about $5 million that we'll have to book for FY20. And the reason right. that it has a loss is because when we set those FY19 rates, uh, we had just barely moved into the new plans and we underestimated the amount of claims that would come through. We thought that we'd see a reduction in claims with the new plan design and that did not occur to the degree expected. Absolutely. And, and Blue Cross Blue Shields actuaries feels that that's exactly what happened. And then in FY20, we thought we were building a break even year, but by last fall, Blue Cross realized that they had underestimated FY20 claims um, that we wouldn't see the reduction that we expected with the new benefits. And so even though they were closer, they felt that FY20 was going to end with about a $4 million loss because we still hadn't quite priced correctly. Correct. And now we know that FY21, we're expecting to draw down at least 1.3 million, not because we didn't price correctly, because we, they would now feel like they've got it right except for now we've got a new benefit design with the statewide commission that they uh, didn't even try to estimate for that we built in the load for. And so we're going to go into FY22 with um, knowing that FY21 isn't priced correctly for the statewide benefit and COVID-19 and below our net position level where we're going to have to keep adding a load to build it up. Right. So that's our financial picture. Can I just ask two quick, I hope quick questions? Sure. So Chris, in the fourth paragraph of your April 29th memo, towards yep. the bottom, you have two sentences. One says there was an expectation that claims would be lessened due to consumer spending with the new plans. And then yep. this savings was not fully realized, as in many cases, HRA funding replaced a layer that was expected to be paid by the subscriber. So that's what you were just talking about. Right. So, you know, these consumer driven health plans, um, the insurance uh, industry and the actuaries, when they price these plans, they assume that um, when someone has a $5,000 uh, potential out of pocket or a deductible of um, $3,000, that they are going to have to pay that money first dollar. And so that that will um, encourage subscribers to price shop, to make decisions, to think about maybe not going to the ER, um, maybe go to urgent care instead. Uh, to, to sort of have the economics of that become part of their uh, decision making. Maybe going to a different pharmacy because it's cheaper um, if you're paying it out of pocket. Lots of times you don't even know if something, how much re something really costs at the pharmacy unless you pay for it yourself. And then you find that, um, you know, you can buy a drug over in one pharmacy for $400 and only spend 150 for the exact same drug at another pharmacy. But when the... Um, HRA funding basically replaced that first layer um, that we did not see the results um, from that consumer driven spending that we expected. Okay, and then my other question is, um, well, I'm gonna ask it in two parts. The first part is, so what needs to happen 
to fix that, quote unquote, and I know that's not a simple question, and then followed by what you're describing is the path that's currently being taken looks like we are in the process of addressing that, but it's taking a few years to do. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, I mean, you know, what, what do we do? I mean, I guess the, the short answer is, as, as far as the consumer driven spending aspect of it, um, you know, that's not up to us, that's up to the commission who's bargaining that. Um, I would hope that the commission would have their full information so they understand what they're making decisions around. But, you know, realistically on that front, really, what can we do? We can raise rates accordingly to compensate for the money that we need to raise. Um, at, and at the same time, keep doing all of our cost and quality initiatives and try to keep um, spending as best we can and, and keep claims as low as possible. But, you know, the bottom line is, is that VHI spends almost all of its money on claims. So, you know, in some businesses, you could look at it and say, do we need to look at what, what kind of overhead expenses are we looking at? What are we looking at here and there and here and there? The reality is, is this is pretty much claims driven. So you can, you, you know, as V high, um, we can only affect so much. Thank you. Joel, may I add something? Thank you. Um, I hope in the future, we as a board and a staff can have a very long and detailed conversation about utilization and prices and their intersection with each other. Um, one of the things we have to bear in mind when we think about costs is that we are under pretty extensive, as everybody else is, inflationary price increases. And when we met with the actuaries at Blue Cross to begin preparing for our F21 rate filing, um, our utilization increase was quite low. In fact, it's, it's consistent with what we've seen in past years. What we are seeing, like everybody else, is a pretty significant increase in medical prices and in particular for RX prices. And those drug costs are really quite severe and in fact, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont has acknowledged that in its public statements about cost increases. So when we look to the future about what can be done, particularly when we get into a discussion about plan design in the future, we need to bear in mind that claims and inflationary pressures are two issues that we need to take up in earnest. But we can't talk about these things in isolation from So Joel, you're on mute if you're talking. I did not mute myself, okay, um, we're back, okay. Thank you uh, both. Uh, so I think the, the suggestion that Mark is making is that we return to this discussion and have, it, have one that's in depth and not quite as rushed as we are here. Chris, I don't know that you're finished. Well, uh, I guess, uh, it, it, it depends on what the board wants. I mean, I feel like that's the overall um, financial position. I certainly could take us through a set of the financial statements if that's um, just to kind of quickly go over line items, if that's what the board would like. I don't, I don't readily see a whole lot of interest <laughs> in doing that this time okay. around. Uh, okay. Although we may, we may have to revisit some of this when we go over the budget. Uh, that, right. said, that said, I've always wondered why, and I think we've had this discussion minimally, is there an obligation of, on the board's part to, act, to quote, accept the financial statements, unquote, or can we just move on and thank Chris for preparing them? Laura, what's your, what's your thought about that? I think traditionally the board has accepted it to demonstrate that it is in receipt and aware. Okay, there's no, no problem in doing so. Uh, is there a motion to accept the the uh, financial statement and reviews and review you know, for April? I guess for March and April. 
Nobody's going to, I see Tracy's finger. I see Tracy's I finger. See I see Peggy seconding it. Uh, any discussion? This is like Jeopardy, Zach. You got to beep in pretty quick. <laughs> uh, no discussion? Seeing none, all in favor, uh, please say aye or raise your thumbs. Thank you. I got it. That's, that's all of us. It's unanimous. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much. Uh, thank Chris, you. Talk about the audit engagement as well. That's we're, for realm. Okay, we're moving right into item nine. And who is doing that? Chris. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Sure. So um, in your packet is the engagement lever from Sullivan and Powers uh, for this year's audit. Um, you know, this is a required audit by statute. Um, we're, you know, regulated by DFR and they require an annual audit. Uh, so this is our annual financial audit, which they would be performed in August um, for our deadline. Our filing deadline with DFR is October 1st. Um, we have uh, Chad Hewitt as the lead for the audit this year. That's rotating our partners. Um, the last couple of years, Rick has been the lead on this audit. So Chad will be the lead this year. And the fee is actually the same as last year. They did not raise their fees. Um, the engagement letter is the same uh, standard language uh, that we see each year. Um, so nothing to highlight there unless uh, anybody had any questions um, about that. Well, then, is, is there a motion to uh, engage Sullivan and Powers uh, as our auditors for the for fiscal 21? I saw Tracy. Zach. Zach. All right. Um, any further discussion? I will only say that, you know, I have questions, sort of just questions whether we should change auditors from time to time. And I'm very well uh, convinced and satisfied that uh, this, this outfit actually does that sufficiently for us so that we don't need to worry about it. Anyhow, uh, all those in favor of uh, renewing this contract with Sullivan and Powers, thumbs up. Got it, thank you. Unanimous again, thank you all. Okay. Move on to renewal of contracts uh, for Zach and Lisa's. I'm not sure benefit or edification. Pe uh, people have been saying the acronym VISTERS. It's the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System. In case you didn't know that, and even if it is even if you did know that, but I thought. You should. So I'll I'll, I'll, I'll the VISTERS and then Mark. Up, you can do Blue Cross, Mark. Right. Um, so the Vermont State Teachers Retirement System is a member of VHI and signs a membership agreement and that meets all of our needs. But the state of Vermont requires an additional contract between us, which is an unusual feature and they're the only member that has that. Um, and they have fairly strict requirements about what does and doesn't have to be in a contract. Um, and they can amend the contract so many times with mo minor changes until they have to start a whole new contract. So we had legal review the last time we did a major contract. This is the last amendment of the current contract before the process will start all over again. I work with the state treasurer's office um, on the changes. They are minor. It has to do with dates. It has to do with amounts, uh, tweaking some reports that they want, some very minor changes. And we've worked um, closely with them and we recommend <laughs> the amendment of the contract um, as provided to you. It meets the needs of the state and VHI is comfortable fulfilling it. Anything in the contract that's at all notable, noteworthy? For no. this year as opposed to the, the contract year. we had into last year? No, it was all very, last year we spent a lot of time on their reporting requirements. Yeah. I'm sure we had that right. This year, I think the biggest thing was that we were gonna move the filing date, FY22, out to uh, the very end of October, and we need to engage with their board um, and work that through, but they were amenable to it. So nothing was material. Okay. 
then are we prepared to act on this? I need a motion to renew the our contract with the state teachers retirement system. Uh, John, if I if if you don't want to make the motion, but want to say something different, that's fine. You want to make the motion first? All right. Uh, is there a second? Uh, I'm going to give this one to Peggy. <laughs> and uh, John, you wanted to say something. You didn't. Okay. Is there any discussion uh, about this? Seeing none, uh, move to a vote. All in favor of renewing the contract with the state teachers retirement system, show your thumbs. Lisa, are you comfortable? Lisa, looks like, all right. Okay. We're all done. Another unanimous uh, vote. I'm going to mute, and Mark can walk you through Blue Cross. Well, we are on the cusp of approving a one year agreement with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for our service contract with them. They had relatively small number of changes to the contract that they wanted to see. We engaged them on those and worked out all the language. The major um, piece that was left to resolve, <clears throat> excuse me, was around the question of Beehive's attribution of lives to One Care Vermont and the all-payer model and language assured that VHI would be the determining uh, force, if you will, the authorization force for any authorization of lives to One Care Vermont and the All Payer model in the future. You will recall we made that decision as an organization earlier this year. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion about it uh, on the board and with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont that also involved One Care. And Zach and um, Lisa. At some point, if you would like a blow-by-blow -blow account of how all that unfolded and the history behind it, please let the management team know and we can certainly sort of bring you up to speed on that recent history. But what we said to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is that we wanted language in the contract that would ensure that VHI was indeed the decision-making authority when it came to any future attribution decision of our covered lives uh, both active and retired and their dependents for any members who were not in Medicare or Medicaid. And they were agreeable to that. However, they did not believe there was sufficient time to negotiate contract language around all of that. And uh, offered instead to put the decision we had reached in a memorandum of agreement or letter of understanding, if you will. And you have a copy of that in your packet. It's dated June 2nd, 2020, and it's a letter to VHI from Andrew Garland, the Vice President of Client Relations and External Affairs at Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. And in this document, he affirms that Blue Cross Blue Shield understands and accepts that any decision in the future to attribute lives to One Care Vermont will be a VHI decision. It defines in paragraph two the covered lives we are talking about. In paragraph three of this document, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont further acknowledges and agrees that it will not speak for or represent VHI in contract negotiations with One Care unless authorized by VHI in writing. And then you can see the final paragraph, one to the fourth paragraph, um, where we are clear that. In the event the VHI board decides it will attribute lives in any configuration to One Care Vermont in the future, that we will negotiate performance agreements, performance metric standards, both to assess One Care's performance and Blue Cross Blue Shield's obligations to us in reference to this One Care Vermont relationship. You will recall as a board, when you made the determination to forego attributing lives to One Care Vermont for 2020, that you authorized the management team um, to begin discussions with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont around performance measures in the event in the future we did attribute lives. And this final paragraph is an affirmation by Blue Cross of that decision. So if you're amenable to this language, it will solidify our understanding with Blue Cross Blue Shield about the One Care issue for the near future. 
and it will effectively bring to a close our contract negotiation with the Blue Cross for the next year. Great, thank you. Zach, did you want to? Am I muted again? No, you. We can hear. Oh, Zach, did no. I was initially just going to say I know Mark had offered the opportunity to to uh, have staff update uh, Lisa and I on some of that blow by blow. So is can I get a can I get a good flavor for that through the minutes um, previously or those other conversations that were not necessarily made? Yeah, as as we can. There's quite a bit of documentation on this. My apologies, okay. some of it's quite dense, but yes, you can I think get a very good flavor for how that conversation unfolded over the course of the last roughly nine to 10 months. And after reading all through all of that, um, you want some further clarification or, or color commentary, uh, we'd be happy to provide it. And if you have any difficulty finding it, or if you have questions about whether or not you've identified all the salient documents, let us know. Great. There's a, there's a lot there, Zach. I'll, you may regret having offered to, there'll be a test at the end of the, next meeting. Uh, and we will be visiting this discussion about One Care Vermont periodically for the next, well, over the course of what's left of this year anyway, and into next year. Uh, that being said, I think we need a, a motion to adopt, to renew the uh, contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont as uh, both amended and uh, added to by this memorandum of agreement or this letter from for, from this June 2nd letter uh, from Blue Cross Blue Shield. Is there a motion to that effect? Does Tracy have a question first though? Oh, I apologize. I was looking at Tracy. Um, comment and question. The comment is that um, with a tremendous amount of grace extended to the team, to the VHI team, given the current unprecedented global pandemic. I thought the board would have an opportunity to hear about the um, deliverables as part of uh, revisiting the contract. Again, understand that wasn't possible or practicable in this situation, but I would love more information on that when the time is right. And part two is, do we have any information on the impact of One Care on our Medicare Medicaid population um, and how that's impacting them? Or is that something we might get in the future? That is likely to be something we'll get in the future. There is data about Medicare population at the statewide level. Mm -hmm. We don't have a specific breakdown for our population is relatively small within that state aggregate. Um, the Medicare numbers at the statewide level are, are quite low uh, in terms of performance. It's unlikely though we're going to get anything on Medicare uh, at the state level for the next, for at least for the next year. One Care is having quite a bit of difficulty at the moment as well. Um, they have asked the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in a letter that went out from the state here uh, late April to be um, removed from the obligation mm -hmm. to tie performance metrics to benchmarks. They just want to report the metrics and not have to actually align them with particular benchmarks that have financial implications. So I, I think at least for the next year, and we don't even yet have the 2019 numbers. Yeah. In one care, we probably won't see anything that fits it in that regard. But in the future, presuming we attribute lives, uh, Blue Cross has, I think, and Bobby, Joe, and Laura, correct me if I mistake this. Blue Cross has told us in the past, as I recall, that they could give us a, a definitive breakdown of our own population when the, when the time was right. Right. Blue, Blue Cross has said that they can ab absolutely give us. Um, a breakdown of our own members if we choose to join uh, a tribute to One Care. Um, just two points. We had a very brief conversation with Blue Cross at some point in the last two months about One Care, just saying that their whole ability to hold One Care accountable in the way they envisioned during this pandemic, pandemic has pretty much gone out the window. 
and that they have been so focused on COVID-19, they have not yet thought about what that looks like. The other piece, Tracy, in response to your expectation, we haven't begun conversation, even among Mark, Bobby, Joe, and myself, about what we think those performance metrics should be um, because of the pandemic. My vision is the three of us will come to some kind of uh, agreement on what we think the best approach is, bring that to all of you to see if, it, if you concur with it, if you want to you know, shape it in some way so that if you decide to attribute lives, we have a starting point for our uh, conversation with Blue Cross. The, the contract is an amendment. The letter of understanding gives us confidence that you have the ability to make decisions around the one care. Diane. Thank you both. I would also, I would also just add to that that um, Blue Cross, uh, you will recall, came to us with a risk sharing proposal. And in the letter to CMS of late April, uh, the state is asking that there be no risk sharing in oh. 2020. Uh, it will be what they call a shared savings. So if there are savings, the provider community shares in accordance with the formula. If there aren't savings, the provider community isn't held financially accountable as they would be if it was a risk sharing model. Okay. So again, to Laura's point, everything is turned on its head right now with, with one care. Okay, uh, Tracy. Oh, you're you're that was a uh, good. Okay. So we still um, need a motion. Yes, it's moved. <laughs> all right, all right, there's a motion to renew the contract with Blue Cross Blue Shield as presented. Is there a second? Please. Second. Peggy. Hey, Peggy. Peggy. <laughs> Thank you. Peggy's very accommodating if you say please. <laughs> Uh, all in favor, please uh, indicate by, again, voting with your thumbs. Thank you all. It's unanimous again. Thank you. We now move into uh, discussion and action on the, what's listed here is the FY21 Vermont EA service agreement. Uh, I don't know how, Zach and Lisa, to give you uh, sufficient background, so I'm not even going to try here. And we'll see how this goes. Uh, but I do want to introduce or have Jeff introduce himself to you. Jeff Fannin is the executive director of Vermont NEA and has just allowed us to see his face for the second time. <laughs> so Jeff, could you, uh, Jeff, this is Zach McLaughlin. Uh, he's hi, Zach, and hi, John. The uh, face you, you may not know. And, no. and I know you know Lisa Grout. I know, I know um, Lisa. And, uh, okay. Good to see everybody else. Um, good to see everybody else well, uh, and not under the weather, as it were. So, yes, yeah, go ahead. Joel. So, so I, I have assumed here that the way to approach this is by uh, uh, providing Vermont NEA the opportunity to make a proposal uh, and to discuss its perspective on this and see how it goes. We are given in the uh, agenda only 15 minutes. We are actually running just a few minutes ahead of schedule. And everyone else knows that I really have to duck out at five o'clock. So if you could keep your presentation short and, and succinct. Uh, sure. Again. Thank so, you. Um, I, I think uh, everybody perhaps except Zach, uh, I'm not sure who, who received it, but back in November, I submitted a, a proposal for um, Vermont EA's reimbursement uh, on, with VHI, and uh, we've discussed it at some length. There were some questions along the way from uh, you, Tracy, that I responded to in January, and, uh, and then March hit and the pandemic, and here we are. So uh, fast forward, um, just so you and John, Zach know, Vermont NEA, along with uh, VSBA, Visbit, many, many years ago, founded VHI. And there was an arrangement in it uh, where Visbit and Vermont NEA had a, had a system where they did, some, they did the work and got paid for it, for lack of a better way to put it. Uh, in 2017, the system changed, and Vermont NEA was, um, budget was, was given a cap, if you will, just a flat line. And it's been at, at 191,000 since 2017. So last year, seeking um, an increase in that amount, I made a proposal in November 
that it go to, and it's based on Mark Page's work on behalf of VHI. Um, and likewise, uh, Bobby Joe does, does her work and others at, at uh, Visbit do work on behalf of VHI. Their number is different. And Vermont and EA's number uh, last year I proposed was, would be 85% uh, or 211, 211,000. Um, so through the discussions, here we are at, at, uh, in June of 2020. The fiscal year ends at the end of this month. Um, and I'm, I'm proposing that we just do away with 20. Uh, I'm, I'm I realize that it's, it's too late in the, the fiscal year to go back in time as much as I would like to. Um, and I think it makes sense to move forward. So I'm proposing a, uh, a next fiscal year budget uh, with a slight increase to based on the same percentage that I proposed in November. And that would bring us to, and I'm trying to keep this short, Joel, to $216,592. So $216,592. And that's uh, based exactly on the, the percentage that um, I proposed in November. It's no different uh, than that percentage. Some changes here in our office. Yoli Turner is no longer working here. She was working with Mark. And so we have a new person. So the cost has gone down a little bit for uh, Mark's administrative assistance, assistant, um, and her portion of it. And that's why it's down. It doesn't look identical percentage wise for those trying to do the percentages. It's based on um, Mark's time, his administrative supports time and some other expenses that are attributable to VHI, Mark's work on behalf of VHI. So um, that's the proposal. I will keep it short and happy to answer any questions. I know uh, others are well versed. Uh, Zach, maybe you less so than others, but I'm happy to answer any questions anybody might have. Thank you. First, a cheap joke. You're not the only person to suggest doing away with 2020. <laughs> okay. Um, Laura. A technical question. Jeff, is there a document you're looking at that I should have or not? Yes. It's the document I gave you back in November, November 7 of 2019. It's November. You, don't, you haven't created a new version of it. No. Okay. Just wanted Same to be Yep. Yep. And then also I referenced to, just so Zach or, or you know, the, uh, the January 15, 2020 memo that I wanted to raise to you. Those are two guys to refer. Uh, John. So I had sent something just before the meeting. I'm not sure if it got to everyone, Jeff, I'm not sure you were included on it. And, I guess I was looking at this from two pieces. I haven't seen it. Uh, one piece. One piece relates to the discussion around "quote unquote" deliverables, right? Because that got left, and that's now I don't want to say change, but I think at some level. And then another piece relates to the actual amount. So, sure. um, so I was prepared or am prepared to um, make a motion. To, to that, and then what I sent along, and I can check, maybe I didn't, in my haste to get it done and get it out before logging into the meeting, it didn't get all the way out. Um, but really to say the, the, the deliverables that were discussed are kind of dated at this point, but something in the order of maybe a quarterly check-in with um, Vermont NEA to the board to say, here's basically what we've done in the last quarter. And it's really informational discussion kind of thing. Less, I guess I would say, metric driven and detailed than some of the stuff that we were getting hung up on back in, I don't even remember, January-ish or sometime in that ballpark. Yeah. So maybe start with that as, as a concept for discussion um, and then talk about, you know, amount. Sure. When you say a check-in on a quarterly basis, A, I think that's reasonable. I think, but I would also submit to you, John, that, that Mark's here at your board meetings. Uh, if you want me, that's fine too. Just like uh, Bobby, Joe, and Laura uh, are, are from, from Visbit. So I think that, um, you yeah. know, if you need something more or more specific, and maybe it's in your letter that I haven't read. I know Tracy just forwarded to me, but I haven't had a chance to read it. Uh, I guess my thought... Um, Jeff was, you know, Mark is both 
a, you know, he's part of the VHI management team, and then he's also working the Vermont NEA service agreement. And I get they're, they're intricately entwined, but to separate out, you know, so that it's not Mark per se, but to really say it's Vermont NEA talking about, here's the work they've done. So I think it would make sense to, at some level, have your presence or voice at the table. And then, you know, Mark is certainly the one who, who is, I would say, the most knowledgeable of it. But I'm not talking about putting a, you know, a ton of detail in there. I think it would just really help, um, I think, the board understand what it, you know, what is the work and allow for some questions to be asked and answered. Again, rather than getting into a level of detail that really started getting, I think, challenging for everyone to get their heads around. I agree. I, you know, I think if my memory serves me correct, your last meeting was uh, in January. Right. And so I was at that meeting and I'm at your next one. I'm, I'm here, John, if you need me, I'm, I'm certainly willing to come to the meetings and answer any questions. And I, you know, I know Mark is, and I know Mark works with the folks of Isbit and they get things, good things done. Well, this, I was really trying to look at what I call people coming, people kind of holding two different positions saying, you know, we need this. And then some, I guess I would say, whatever you want to call it, um, censor or feelings about that. And this is, to me, was a way to say, let's get something relatively, I think, agreeable and reasonable just into the service agreement to say, okay, we're doing that. If it's what we're already doing, that's great. I don't think it's asking for more. And as you said, I mean, it, you know, it seems like a pretty reasonable approach. So basically, John, what you're suggesting is <clears throat> adopting some numerical figure and attaching to it some statement in the agreement that that under which Vermont and EA, at the request of the VHI board, will uh, provide updates on activities over the previous period of time. You said quarterly, I realize, but yeah. is that essentially the, the sense of it? That's yeah. So nothing, that what nothing, it, what it might be is an agenda item once a quarter ish yeah. Yeah. that says. Or about any a report out on service agreement maybe it's a 10 minute agenda item who knows okay uh zach so so what would be the, the nature of that report john lawyers about it what would, would just uh, I, I i hear you say oh sorry you're muted but i i hear you saying that that uh that it would be kind of a broad thing but i, I i'm wondering how broad are we talking? Well, right now, it would not be a list of the trainings that have happened in the past three months because there haven't been a heck of a lot of trainings in the past three months. There have been efforts around helping to, I would assume, members as questions came up or, you know, um, doing the work for the, you know, VHI, I guess, that Vermont NEA is doing to address the needs of the crisis we're in right now. Some of that is done, again, in conjunction with the management team. But I think historically, my understanding is, you know, um, Vermont, Aldi, Vermont NEA also was kind of contracted to figure out what, I don't know if professional development is the right word, what education of um, VHI members should, you know, should they get in in whatever manner so it would I, to me it would be helping the board to understand that because again having been a VHI member for 21 years and now having been on the board for about a year um i'm not sure i have 100 percent clarity and i think it would just be trying to get that particularly for the board members my head my face was down anybody else in the speaking order yet um, what well, I was attempting to. Is there a motion on the table? Or not? Oh, Laura, I'm in the I middle. Don't know of, if there's a motion on the table or not? Laura, Laura, I'm in the middle of saying that I put, put, put some language together to for a motion. I'm wondering if this will work. Well, I thought John made a motion, Joel. So before you did it, I just wanted to clarify that. I have words that he made a motion. So I'm trying to clarify whether he did. I apologize, John. I don't think you made a motion, did you? Well, I. I had one prepared because it's yes. somewhat long. I just sent it in the chat. I can read it. I'm sorry. I did, I'm, I, I Understood. Read, why don't you read yours? Go ahead. All right. 
part of the reason that I waited was because I had put an amount in there and Jeff just put a different amount on the table. So I would say I'll put the motion out and then we'll have discussion, but I move and we adopt the one-year service agreement with Vermont NEA as presented in the email I just sent prior to this meeting or in the written proposal that I will present if we wanna make it say that, which includes a 6% increase in compensation a provision for quarterly check-ins so the board can better understand the work of Vermont NEA in support of VHI. So that's a motion? Is that was a motion, that's a motion. A second? I don't see a second, John. Tracy, are you now seconding or? Yes, I'm seconding. Okay. Okay, uh, you now know that, if I understand it right, uh, Jeff, you've proposed uh, an amount on $216,592. Right. Okay. And just for the sake of discussion. John's proposal is 202460. Okay. Right. So we're and, and it looked to me like, and I did it quickly, that um, what Jeff's amount was is about a 13.4% increase over the current amount. Also over the fiscal 17 amount. Correct. And so I, I can I, I can, remember that. It's I can say where I can yeah. that contract's been flatlined for four years now. Correct. And and I can say where, you know, I had said the six percent from saying two percent as an a, re, a reasonable annual amount over three years. I think Jeff's now talking about forget about year three, let's talk about year four. I understand that. But again, you know, I put it in there to get an amount out. I honestly the quarterly check-in piece was the piece that I was trying to get resolved because I knew we were going to have likely a discussion around them. All right. <clears throat> discussion. Zach? So, so we, and I, as the new guy, I apologize. So when we, um, how many other entities as a, does VHI um, contract with? The, the, the primary uh, analog here is our contract with VISBIT. And you're yep. looking at basically the recipients of most of the funding from VHI in the form of mm -hmm. Mark for Vermont NDA services, Bobby Joe, Laura, and wherever she went, Chris actually as a recipient. <laughs> oh, I apologize, right there. Uh, you came back uh, as the uh, recipient of the bulk of the funding for VISBIT. There, there is a, a wellness program and a couple of other doodads associated with VISBIT compensation. Uh, but you're looking at pretty much the, 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 uh, the bulk. So, so for, when we, for what it's worth, if you were to look at, and we can, yeah. look at the changes in the amount that we pay for VISBIT under yeah. a contract that reads a little differently, but nevertheless, it's an annual contract, you would see increases ranging upwards of 7% uh, on occasion. This year's is 3% on top of last year's 7% and on and on like that. We we but we used to provide Vermont NEA two hundred seventy five thousand dollars for its services, mm -hmm. and for the mm -hmm. last four years we have provided it one hundred ninety one thousand dollars. We used to provide Visbit eight hundred eighty thousand dollars, I think something like that, six years ago, and we're now at about one million one hundred thousand. Sure. Do you, so, and yeah. I guess my question is is um, I understand the the discrepancy in the pace at which people have received um, money. Uh, I guess my question is, to what extent do we have, I know when we're talking about Blue Cross Blue Shield, we're talking about metrics. Do we have metrics for what our outputs are expected from Visbit or do we, is it kind of, Visbit just kind of, we just kind of come to a handshake agreement with Visbit or how, how does that work? And I'm just trying, I'm trying to understand that in relation, if the two major entities that are that we contract with or Visbit in, in Vermont NEA. I'm just trying to understand if, if we do, do we expect metrics of output from anybody? You know, I think there are different answers from each of us about each of these agreements, but ultimately this board has expressed general satisfaction with the services provided after reviewing them. 
generally speaking, annually by both Nisbet and Vermont and EA. Tracy has offered up a different viewpoint about Vermont and EA, but we have evaluation documents that are, I don't know, have we received, we received them, didn't we? They're, they're not in the materials, are they, for this meeting? But they were submitted by both Nisbet and Vermont and EA in accordance with the contractual deadline of April 15th. So uh, there's a lot more uh, behind this, Zach. But my hope against hope is that in the four minutes we <laughs> remaining in this discussion, we can actually put at least this service agreement to bed. My, my personal preference is obviously uh, to expand on John's rather basic 6% proposal to Jeff's rather basic $216,000 proposal and add the language that uh, John has otherwise offered in order to get us over this hump for at least one year. So I think that's, so the motion remains uh, as John presented it with a 6% increase on 191,000 in addition to the language relating to I guess periodic check-ins about Vermont EA's activities, but using his specific wording. Is there a, I'll, I'll make a motion if there's no other uh, one. There's, um, there's a motion on the floor that's seconded, John and Tracy. Right, and I will, uh, Peggy. Um, John, are you open to a, a amendment to change to some looking for some compromise here. So we'll keep the quarterly check-ins in place and it will increase the dollar amount to the $216,592 that Jeff had um, referenced in his speech. This would address the fact that, we have, um, that the payments data has been different for the last several years, um, but it might account for, might help folks by receiving the quarterly check-ins. Um, I don't know. Are you open to that? You're muted. <laughs> what I said you didn't that you didn't hear was well. <laughs> I didn't want you to go too far. <laughs> Again, I have been less involved in the long history of this. I I, I will you know. Um, state that for, for fact. I don't know, you know, I think I have a better understanding of what the, the details of the Visbit service agreement, you know, what I guess you would say, what the work is, how it gets measured, how it gets paid for. I don't know what the increase is over the last four years for the Visbit contract was. And I think it was based on, again, specific justification each year. Um, and I also saw, I don't want to leave out that, you know, Lisa did send a question into the chat, which, you know, which I want to throw in there as well. But I guess um, it, I'm trying to look at overall cost, overall increases, and a lot of different pieces. So to me, 2% a year seemed like something reasonable to start. I was Peggy before you said that said, you know, willing to say to me, then if we're talking about one more year moving up to 8% from 6%, that's still a ways away from what Jeff had kind of put on the table both before and now. So I guess I have two different questions or one question and then I want to address Lisa's question. The first is, um, do we have four years worth of the last three years and then what we are anticipating for this next year, what the visbit increases were? Not that they should be the same because I think circumstances may be different. And then I think Lisa's question is, how much does this add to Mark's workload? I guess what I would say is my understanding, and I would look for Mark or someone else to confirm this is, this is Mark's workload. I mean, so I think what Jeff was saying is the, using the metric that 85%, and I may not have this exactly right, of Mark's work is attributable to VHI. Um, and so I think that 85% of Mark's workload is VHI work is really where this is coming from. 
part of the reason we were talking about metrics is the question of, you know, how much of Mark's workload is, is 100% of his workload V high? How much is specific to Vermont NEA that's not V high? And if so, what portion? And I don't have any way of knowing that. Just, just in, uh, Zach, maybe, or John, this helps address it. In my November 2019 memo, uh, what we did was just look at Mark's time, frankly, what he had logged for time. And it came out to 90.07% uh, of Mark's uh, hours were attributable to VHI. So that's why I, you know, I gave the, you know, at that point we were in November, I brought it down to 85, but it said uh, for my proposal was 90%, 90% for 20 and 21, FY20 and FY21, I guess, or whatever, you know, so at 90%, which is where we, you know, that's, that's what got me to the, uh, the 216 just based on Mark's time. And, and I understand that. John, I don't think you actually answered the, uh, Peggy's question about your willingness to move. You said- Well, I guess I, guess I felt like I did saying I'm, I'm willing to move to 8% and then said, I realize that's not what Jeff's request was or what Peggy's uh, request was. Okay. But my question was also, um, do, is it easy to get, does, does someone have at their fingertips what the increase to the Visbit service agreement was the last year, the year before the, and the year before? I'll bet Chris does off the top of her head. I do not know that all off the top of my head. Um, shocked. <laughs> so, okay. so, I mean, I could try and look that up. It's usually more complicated than this. You know, That's this is I not a simple answer when it comes to Visbit's side. You have one and a half staff members or two staff members, however many. I don't know if the assistant's at 85%, but you have two people at the Vermont NEA. Chris, the question was simply, what are the increases? The I don't know. Okay, but they have been on the order of 3 to 8%. Annually. I don't know that either. I'd have to look up the numbers. I'm sorry. Well, the answer, John, we will find, but that's pretty much it. Because I've done this. I don't have it in front of me either. Uh, I would like to make a suggestion, John, to your, your, your logical nature. Your proposal is based on 2% increases to an arbitrary number. John, Jeff's proposal is pegged to a specific portion of his staff's time. Which is the better number to use? Can I speak, please? Not yet. I asked John a question. Think about it. Tracy? Um, well, first, I would say that the uh, 191,000 is not an arbitrary number. It's based on the calculations that I believe perhaps you and your executive director put for. No, you, no, that's that's simply not true. Okay, then you, then Jeff did. You you did please your. Don't, please don't interrupt me. They were put forth by one of Truth the helps. executive directors of Vermont NEA, and based upon a review of the um, services that we had uh, evidence of delivery. Um, so I do want to make that make that statement. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is that a comparison to the Visbit contract is um, not only complicated by the amount of different services and the types of services that are provided, but also by the fact that Visbit trues up to their actual costs at the end of each fiscal year. So while a budgeted amount might reflect an increase, folks do time studies and track actuals and there's a truing up at the end of the year. So it would be a project um, to evaluate um, not only the budgetary increases, but the budgets to the actuals based on the true up because there is that difference between those two service agreements. Those are the two things I wanted to say. Um, I just want to point out, though, I'm sorry, I believe that um, both Visbit and Vermont NEA have provided the information that's been asked of them in the past. 
we have not created anything that's different or more specific. So the information that we've received about, you know, Mark's time studies is the same as what Disbit has put forth. 85% um, of the time, we see the work every day as a board. We see a day, the results of his work all the time. Um, I'm just always a little confused on why it seems like there's certainly different standards when it comes to um, these contracts. And whether it's Vistas, Blue Class, Blue Shield, Visbit, we're, out, we're like, yeah, they're doing their work. It's a good thing. We're going to, money's reasonable. And then there's just this huge bog down now. And it's been going on for months. <laughs> So I'd love to see us jump on John's bandwagon of trying to find some compromise and go forward. And we have to do it quickly. And then we have, to, if, assuming we can get through that, then, then maybe we can um, act on the budget uh, as a totality. Zach? I, I would just, in, I would agree with Peggy. It's the, cons I, what I'm looking for is consistency. And I don't know, that's why I was asking before, how do we handle other contractors? I'm look as a new guy to this experience, I'm looking at this and thinking about running my school district and how I deal with contractors. And I would have clearer outputs that I could, I could just, you know, I, that were, that I could see at the end, whether or not I was getting a certain value for what I was doing. I, what I'm, and that's the question I'm asking about Visbit. I mean, are we also, is it a similar situation with Visbit where it's kind of like, we did some stuff, we had some conversation, great, seems good. Or is it, or is there a more complex report out process for visit? And if not, then that's, then maybe in the future, maybe we should look at for, for both entities, looking at um, some clear guidelines in terms of how we evaluate. Uh, I, I don't think the, I don't think you get any objection to that from any source. Uh, Chris, then we've got to move on. Sure. I just wanted to, hopefully I can help address Zach's um, question. Um, so, when we put together the budget that we bring to the uh, VHI board for Visbit, um, it is based on actual costs. There is no profit built in, and it is based on time studies and people's times. So my time is evaluated. Everyone who puts time into VHI, it's a direct calculation of portion of the salaries and benefits by percentage over the different programs that work on. So that is the formula that's used. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's essentially the way that I think Jeff would describe Vermont and Ye's approach to this too. So, um, um, there was a question raised by Peggy of John whether he would ag would agree to simply amend his motion to reflect the amount in Vermont and Ye's proposal. Uh, I'm going to ask for a, a motion to that effect, whether it comes from John or not. And I'll make it if need be. So I, I move to amend the amendment, amend the motion to reflect the amount proposed by Vermont and EA as reflective of the percentage of staff time dedicated to be high. Uh, and that amount is $216,000 and it's $216,592. Is there a second? I see, uh, well, Peg raised her hand first. Uh, discussion? All those in favor, uh, please say aye. All those opposed? We have defeated that amendment and uh, Looks like we're not going to resolve this again. Well, there's a motion still on the table to approve the contract with an increase, and John said he was amenable to increasing that to 8%. If that motion with the friendly amendments still out there, that can be voted upon. Should be voted upon. He can't, he can't make a friendly amendment on his own, to his own motion. And you have to decide whether it's, a, whether it's friendly, if that doesn't work. Uh, I think we'll just move on to voting on the, uh, I haven't heard anybody make a, make a motion to amend. So well, I, I, besides what you just defeated. I, I would make that motion. I mean, and, and I think if I understood right, Peggy was asking me if I would be willing to amend it to the amount that Jeff put forth. 
and I had said I, I wasn't ready to do that, I would amend it to go to 8%, certainly. I had indicated I would do that. Right. If for nothing else, for the record, I suppose. Right, but I'm not sure you're in a position to make that proposal. So I move to amend John's motion to provide for an 8% increase. And you can accept it as friendly. Okay. You can't accept your own as friendly, that's all. Right? Yes. I think. Um, all right. Uh, discussion about that. I guess I'd like to hear from Jeff Fannin. Again, we've accepted the amounts that have been put forth by Viz and by across all the others. Jeff, is that something that's doable so that we would maintain the same level of services from Vermont NEA? Would it impact the level of services? Um, would it impact? The answer is uh, probably not. Would it fairly compensate Vermont NEA the work that it's been doing for the last five years? I don't think so. We're still at more than an $80,000 reduction from where we were in 2016. And I, I just think it's, it um, does not reflect well on VHI that one of its contractors has an increase and the other has a sizable decrease. Uh, all we're trying to, it's not as if I'm, I'm seeking to go back to where we were in 2016, mind you, at 275. Uh, I'm just trying to go to a more reasonable number of 216. And uh, so, <clears throat> you know, I understand and appreciate the 8%, John. I'm not, I'm not looking a gift horse in the mouth, but certainly I don't think it reflects accurately the work that Mark is doing, that Vermont EA is doing. Um, and uh, it's disappointing, to say the least. I personally uh, simply can't accept uh, building on an artificial number like that, John. And I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm not surprised. That's not the issue. I'm, I guess, we just heard from Chris that Visbit's number is carefully considered and presented and it's based on time. I don't see what the logic, and Zach suggests more, uh, more out of innocence than, than history, that Visbit and Vermontier should be treated reasonably alike. I think that's a fair uh, characterization of what Zach said. I don't know, it's, it's not as though VHI cannot afford uh, $10,000 here and there, uh, especially to make one of its primary service providers satisfied. So uh, I personally cannot uh, accept uh, an 8% increase. I'm just, I get to participate in the discussion as the chair of a small board. Um, so if you're ready to vote, we can vote and then we won't be in a position to act on the, on the, uh, overall budget because we will not have resolved this matter. Um, I guess I'll ask, uh, all those in favor of, uh, adopting the motion, uh, presented by John regarding quarterly check-ins and an 8% increase to the fiscal 17 number of $191,000 signified by raising your hand. I see uh, only two, there's all those opposed. I see four. So, um, we are where we've been. And I would. Should we be voting on um, what um, Jeff presented? I'm not sure if that was ever exactly in a motion or not. I no, know that John's the, was. In the, uh, there's a, a motion available to, to simply merely to increase the amount paid to whatever want, including what Jeff suggested, and then there can be amendments to it that would incorporate John's 
uh, quarterly check-in language. I think you voted on that in the amendment because the amendment was John's quarterly language and Jeff's amount. And it there could be, there, there needn't be, there could be simply a, a motion limited to the amount and then there could be a discussion about whether to amend it. So Peggy, if you want to make a motion to that effect. Sure. So I move that we approve the Vermont NEA service agreement um, with the dollar amount of $216,000, sorry, 216592 And um, yeah, for FY21. Is there a second? Well, I'll second. Uh, uh, discussion? Lisa. I'm not sure what's going on. Can anybody help? Is this something I should be doing here to help? No, I don't know what's going on. I've, I've unmuted her. I'm trying. Maybe she's also trying. There we go. Oh, there she is. All right. Sorry, I'm functioning in slow motion here. My uh, my internet is is being That's stretched plain. to the okay. fullest. That, All right. that well, if you if you started your trouble. response, Sorry. start it over again. I can't hear you now. So. Lisa, you're up. Well, I think you're unmuted, Lisa. Oh, I am. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I just, it just seems to me that recognizing Vermont NEA's efforts and ARC's efforts um, makes sense in terms of allowing the board to move forward. John, you want to make an amendment or not? No. Any any further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying, by raising your hand. All those opposed? Lisa, uh, uh, Laura, you have the breakdown? Okay. All right, well, I'm afraid I'm gonna to have to depart. Uh, Laura, I know that you're anxious for Visbit's, for the for VI's budget to be acted on, but we can't act on this budget without resolving the Vermont NDA service agreement amount. And so I'm going to put off consideration of the VI budget until we figure this out. I am open to any suggestions about how to resolve this impasse. I've never understood it. I don't understand it. And that's beyond my powers or limited ability to figure out how to proceed. Uh, so um, um, Zach, you seem interested in, <laughs> in formulating a thought about this. Well, yeah, I just, I'm in part of this might be, my ability to get over the hump might be, if I had both the, Kind of looking at the, the Visbit agreement and this today, I might have been saying, and if they were similar in terms of, in terms of um, me being able to evaluate outcomes, I might have said no to both. But I'm not <laughs> voting on Visbit today. You know, uh, I'm, I'm voting on 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 this one, and so um, and I might have been looking for more from Visbit. So part of it for me is before the next time that we sit down, I'd want to have an understanding of what the expectation is from Vis Visbit and what is the um, how do we come to how do we how do I come to evaluations uh, thoughtful evaluations for members uh, about that and then making sure that there's a similar standard because I, I do that would be my expectation and I, and I have a hard time evaluating the how parallel those two things are right now but mm -hmm. I know that what I see here I, if if the if um, it was a similar makeup for the visbit agreement I'd be just as uncomfortable with the visbit agreement and I just don't know what that looks like. 
I understand. My, my, I raise the question, though, and that is about the amount. How would any of that discussion resolve in your mind the amount that should be paid to Vermont and EA? You don't have to well, answer that now, but that's the... Well, I could just, I mean, part of it for me to get to an amount, I have to get to, mm -hmm. I have to have a, 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 a richer understanding of what is being, what is being done to then come to a conclusion about whether or not the amount which we're discussing is a proper evaluation of the service. And again, I would hold Visbit to the same standard. And if I had the same document in front of me from Visbit, I would similarly be like, well, what am I gonna to use to come to an evaluation? Okay, I understand. And uh, there's no point in trying to break down the distinctions between Visbit's approach and Vermont and EA's approach now, uh, but we can definitely put that on the agenda for the next meeting and provide you information in, be in uh, between now and then. That would go to the entire board. We, uh, Laura, we have uh, four minutes and then I'm out of here. So um, just a point of clarification for you, Zach, Visbit has a three-year agreement um, and we're in year one of that. So that's why Visbit's not in front of you right now. Mm -hmm. Second, the way that we handled it last year when VHI board did not adopt the budget before the beginning of the fiscal year is that um, we continue to meet all of your contractual obligations and pay all expenses. There was no increase to the wellness program. We weren't asking for an increase anyway. Laura, I think you're speaking past him. He doesn't, I don't think Zach, you have the, he needs more information in, uh, than we can possibly impart in just this limited period of time. Right, I'm letting Zach and actually Lisa also know that the, um, even without a budget, because we had to go through this before, all of the obligations of VHI will continue to be met. Um, and finally, I wanted the minutes to reflect a thank you to John Service before we hit the five o'clock. Oh, yeah. Of course, okay. And I also wanted to mm -hmm. remind you that we'll, you'll be getting a note from Lisa to schedule a meeting in the week of October 19th to set the, set the health rate. So don't plan vacations that week, please. All right. So that's a, that's a, a well-known holiday week for teachers, <laughs> I don't think. Uh, all right, on my way out, here are the uh, uh, agenda items for the next meeting that I think uh, we talked about in no particular order. And more in-depth discussion of the One Care Vermont uh, relationship. Uh, Mark Mark's uh, statement about our need to discuss the relationship uh, an intersection between utilization and prices. Uh, I think we have to revisit this somehow and we have to uh, work on the VHI budget overall. Those are the items that I, that I noted. Any other items? Uh, in, terms of next, in terms of a next meeting date, I, it's, it's a little late to try to figure that out now, but I'll, I'll bet we have the mechanism through which we can figure out how to schedule meetings. Is that right, Laura? So if you give me um, your general sense of when you want it to take place, I'll have Lisa work on it. Well, how about uh, between now and July 15th? All right. You want to meet by July 15th? I guess that's what I meant. Is that all right? Anybody want to postpone it? I'm well, it's a, it's a quick turnaround for us, but if that's your agenda item, I'm... Let's, uh, look, you, you put me on the appropriately, put me on the spot. I just came up with the date. I don't, I, don't well, I didn't know last year we avoided the month of July because it was one of the only breaks that any all of you in the school system had and we were asked not to schedule so I didn't know if you were looking at August or why don't we why don't we even do why don't we not do anything yet and send around a request for people's um, basic thoughts about when to meet I, I have no necessary excuse me no necessary inclination to meet before July 15th I just said July 15th And I'm retired. I'm on vacation most of the time. Okay. A motion to adjourn. 
is in order. You don't need a motion. You can just adjourn. I adjourn. Thank you all very much. Uh, I, I hope luck, John. we can resolve this. Good luck, John. And uh, actually, good luck, Lisa, and good luck, Zach. <laughs> good, to, good to meet you. Take care, everybody.